So um, hi, everybody. I'm Kwan Nguyen, as already mentioned. I come from MIT, and we've been working here on this prototype 1,000-core machine. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what we've been up to so far. So one of the general considerations we want to have as we go into the future of computing that, is that we want to increase the number, um, increase raw compute available to our applications. And one of the ways that we can do this is, well, OK, we want to increase the number of cores, and we also want to increase the amount of memory on our system. But um, one of the things that we would like also is this kind of unified single address space that's easy for programmers to write their applications with. But, and then, well, and then there's another thing, which is when we want to add more compute, the logical answer is to add more cores. But the th problem with doing that is that as we add more cores, our traditional coherence protocols start to break down because they don't scale. I'm naming specifically the full map directory protocol. So what we've done to address this scalability issue here is we've created TARDIS, which is this new cache coherence protocol. I'll be, and throughout this talk, I'll be going through a brief example about how that um, how that protocol works, and I'll be explaining its scalability advantages. After that, we'll be making the case for a thousand core prototype, and then we'll see how Risk Five fits into all of this. So, TARDIS, in short, is this new scalable cache coherence protocol, and one of the things it does is it tracks uh, consistency through timestamps in a way that scales in an O log of n fashion for an n core system. One of the key ideas of TARDIS is that it implements this with logical leases. And basically, we have two ideas in a logical leasing scheme. We can read from a cache line if we have a valid lease, and we can write to it as long as this lease has expired. There's, another, there's a paper that explains this in very thorough detail, but I'll go through a kind of a brief example of how this works. But first, let's start with a block diagram. In our typical system here that we're considering, we have some number of cores with some private L1 data caches. These are connected to a last level cache through some on-chip network. Our last level cache, by the way, also has our manager, which controls kind of the coherence rules here. And this is connected to some main memory or what have you. Now let's go through, um, now let's go through the state that we're going to have to add in order to incorporate TARDIS into any system that we want. For each cache line, we'll have to introduce some new client state per, per L1 private cache data <coughs> cache line. We'll have to add two timestamps, WTS and RTS. WTS and RTS are, mark the start and the end of the lease, respectively, and they stand for the write timestamp, WTS, and the read timestamp, RTS. At the manager, we're going to have to add the same thing, the write timestamp and the read timestamp as well for each manager cache line. And for each core, we're also going to have to add this register. This register is called PTS, and this PTS register tracks the position of this core or this client in, relative to the data stored in the cache lines in its private cache. Now let's go through an example. Let's have this code here with the interleaving that you see reading from top to bottom. You have these two cores, as well as a manager. Now let's start with storing A. This A is some cache line that we want to store to. And what we do is we send a me message to the manager. The manager will grant exclusive ownership to core 0, and we'll set some fields, owner, WTS, RTS. And once we have this cache line, we'll go ahead and get We'll get the data in this cache line. We'll store our new value, A prime. And by, we do this by creating this new version at WTS and RTS is equal to 1. You'll notice that this is different from the one that we have in the manager at 0, 0. And for, in order for core 0 to make this update, we also have to update its position in this logical lease, or this logical time, rather, to PTS 1. And that's updated at the top right of core 0. Now let's see what happens if we load B. This is a load miss here, so we'll send a, we'll send a message to the manager to say that we want to load from this cache line. We'll lease B out to core 0. And what we do here is we'll, we'll create a lease. We'll have a lease that starts at timestamp 1, and we'll have it end at timestamp 11. And there's a few ways of creating leases, but the simplest way right now is just to create a constant time lease, and in this case, it's 10. So we lease from 1 to 11. We'll give this cache line back to core 0, and we'll read this cache line B at PTS1. And it knows to read it at 1 because that's the PTS that we sent to the manager. Now let's see what happens if core 1 wants to store to B. Now, we send the PTS to the manager, so core 1 does that. But here's, some, here's a key observation. We can actually have core 1 be instantly granted exclusive ownership of this cache line, even though it's currently being read at core 0. This is 
This, in effect, causes us to jump ahead in time, ahead of the end of the lease at timestamp 11, and thereby lending, by the way, this protocol its name. It allows us to jump ahead in time, this time traveling cache coherence protocol. And now we get to write to B at PTS 12. And what's really important to notice here is that different, B, different versions of B coexist at the same, same physical time. Now let's see what happens if we load from A. Now this is pretty much no different than any, any ordinary protocol. We'll have to issue a write back request to get core zeros um, modifications to A prime back. And we'll write that back to the manager and then finally grant that to core one, at which time it can then read from this, uh, this cache line. Finally, let's load B in core zero. It turns out that this is actually a cache hit. Because B's lease is actually still valid at core zero, we can just read from it in this case. And what's important to notice here is that the sequential order, which I have written with this red arrow here, it does not match the physical order in which the, lo the loads and stores are actually performed, which is the blue arrow here. So with, all that, with that example in mind, let's make a case for the scalability of this protocol. We only track one node. We only track the exclusive owner of any particular cache line. So this means only log and storage. There's no broadcast invalidations. Thanks to the leasing scheme, we don't have to track the read-only shares of any cache lines. So when it comes time to you know, write new data, we can just jump ahead in time and grant exclusive ownership instantly. Furthermore, I should note here that timestamps aren't tied to the core count. You can compress these timestamps as well. We have we proposed a few schemes for doing that. And one important thing to note is that you don't need synchronized real-time clocks as you might need in a physical time-based leasing scheme. So we've got this thousand, we've got the scalable protocol. Let's try to build something out of this. So we want to try to ex, you know, extend this and see how well it works. So let's build a thousand core system. We're going to fit as many cores as we can on some zinc boards, EC706, and we want to connect them in a 3D mesh. So let's say we have, well, 64 FPGA boards. We'll have some Aurora links. There's six, if we have six of them, we can connect them in northeast, southwest, up and down. And we can go ahead and demonstrate shared memory systems at scale. We've even already got a name, actually. We're going to call it T1000. It's the time-traveling antagonist from Terminator 2. And well, 1000 is 1000 cores. We're going to figure out what to do with the extra 24. So RISC-V and TARDIS. We have this protocol. We have this 1000 core system. And we need an architecture for this system. Well, RISC-V has this clean, extensible orthogonal and most of all free uh, these properties that make it so favorable to implement them on such a system. And furthermore, the code from rocket chip, for example, makes it, which is written in chisel, is very easy to extend. You can extend just the features that you need to implement such a protocol without having um, to go into too many of the low level details of things that aren't so important to TARDIS. But there's a few things to consider. For example, the protocol I just described to you in the example is actually a sequentially consistent version of TARDIS. RISC-V is uh, implementing release consistency. So we want to adapt TARDIS to support th these release consistency semantics. Furthermore, there's a few things that we need to comment on about atomic instructions. And also there's this, um, and also we can talk a little bit later after this presentation if you want to learn about how we can use these atomic instructions to implement the synchronization primitives which you'll need to program a thousand core machine. So let's compare the con consistency models here. If we start with sequential consistency, which basically states that if some event x occurs before some event y in program order, then this x also occurs before y in the global serial or global memory order. And in TARDIS, we merely make this a rule based on timestamps. So if x precedes y in program order, then we enforce this constraint in TARDIS that x precedes y in this timestamp order. But let's move on to release consistency. So in, in release consistency with ordinary memory ops like loads and stores, you will, do, you will just do as much as necessary to respect the control and data dependencies. But for things like acquires, you will adapt some rules to implement, for example, if some acquire happens before x in the program order, then acquire will happen before x in the global memory order. We'll just merely make the same rule in TARDIS just as the way that we've done for sequential consistency. The same goes for releases and for the acquire and release operations themselves. We'll organize them as we do, as 
um, specified by release consistency semantics. So there's a few things that, um, that our implementation has done to implement release consistency on TARDIS. We track, instead of using PTS, we track two different, two, actually three other timestamps. First, we have a timestamp that bounds the timestamps of future operations with something called TS min, or the minimum timestamp. We'll track the maximum timestamp of the preceding ops with timestamp maximum. And with these two timestamps, we can do a few things, such as fences, by moving uh, by setting constraint on future operations. And we have some other rules, like doing acquires and releases with this timestamp rel or timestamp release here. And we can create these rules to implement uh, release consistency on TARDIS. There's one thing I wanted to note in particular, especially as, as far as instru atomic instructions are concerned. It turns out that TARDIS has this nice solution to low reserve store conditional live locking, where you have this, these two cache lines and two competing cores just bouncing back and forth. Now, I, know, I understand that risk 5 has a certain guarantee, but we can actually make it a lot cleaner here by observing that the right timestamp, or WTS, tracks the cache line version. So it is sufficient to check for that the right timestamp, when we did the load reserved operation, just matches the right timestamp of the store conditional operation has not changed between the two oper instructions. So let's give a quick example about how that works. Let's say that core zero performs some low reserved instruction on C. It gets exclusive ownership and sets this reservation register that contains the, the timestamp, the right timestamp is equal to zero. Then let's say that during, in that time, core one also pre performs this low reserve instruction. Core zero gets downgraded from its uh, exclusive ownership and then gets and then core one gets exclusive ownership of this cache line. But then when core zero comes around to performing the store conditional, it'll go ahead and send a message to get exclusive ownership back to core, to core zero. And what's really interesting here is that it actually it can actually succeed even though that cache line has been invalidated because we observe that WTS has not changed for this cache line. This means that the data at core zero has not changed since we performed the load reserved operation. And we can go ahead and write our store conditional op the data in our store conditional operation to the cache line at core zero, and it succeeds. So we've been implementing this prototype. We have we have the rocket ship repository, and we've been adding a few things. And these are just some of the few things that we've added. In the rocket core, we've had to add timestamps like the minimum and maximum timestamp. In the helicache, we had we add some metadata and we had some hit miss logic. We'll have to, and we'll also have to augment the tile the tile link network on chip to support transmitting message, uh, timestamps in our messages. And finally, in our last level cache, we'll add some new coherence logic. For example, we have to get rid of broadcast and validations because we don't use that anymore. All right, that's it. I'd like to thank um, Srini and Shang Yao for their advice and input and all the help here, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Uh, a PSU consultant. Um, so, um, so the, this all works inside the cores because they can sort of live in virtual time and be slightly different. But when you do I.O. Mm -hmm. and interact with the outside world, the I.O. device, the, the, the I.O. thing has mm -hmm. to understand this and reorder everything to get it into real time. OK, that's a fantastic question. And um, looking at this block diagram here, we have this like connection to main memory, which is kind of a kind of a similar situation here. But in terms of I.O. and in terms of main memory, what we can do is we can add two registers um, uh, at, le at a minimum, perhaps, that covers a, the, the, maximum read, the maximum write timestamp of any data written to or, written, uh, or read from some outs, external device, as well as the maximum write, read timestamp. And this allows us to get some ordering, although a little bit at a more coarser grain level than we do between the L2 and the L1. Yeah, so yeah. in practice, how big of a span, you know, the, the window in practice of the, you know, the time window mm -hmm. do you see? This large, this depends on actually several factors. Number one, the length of your leases. And number two, of course, the nature of your program. If, if it writes, it reads out a lot of I.O., then you're going to see those two, those two, like, memory timestamps or I.O. timestamps increase rapidly. But as our testing bench, as our test system doesn't actually perform I.O., uh, 
um, I can't really comment on that sense. But for the for movement to main memory, it tends to move well as quickly as you have to write back to main memory. And um, for the small application that we've had, obviously they don't really increment that much. So the other the other way that comes to mind for dealing with the uh, scalability problem of directories with thousands of clients is to have intermediate levels of directories like you, like you, the last level cache would be would would directly serve thirty two next to last level caches each of uh -huh. which would serve thirty two cores. Uh, can you say anything about about the trade offs of of your system relative to that? Sure. So I think part of the elegance of this scheme is that you can actually have this kind of flat hierarchy that all communicate with just one central manager in this scheme without having the attendant complexity of implementing this hierarchical directory scheme. And it's a, it's a fine point of having this kind of scheme that kind of scales a little bit better, but ultimately you're still down to these uh, multitudes of directory bits. Uh, other other question: sure. uh, If you're doing fixed least uh, fixed length leases, that seems to create a bit of a problem. Where if it you if a the core makes a read for something that that it hasn't read recently, and it has to and it has to update its timestamp by more than ten steps in order to get the most recent version, it's effectively lost all of its cached instructions and data. That is one of the consequences of. Um, having th this kind of fixed leasing uh, scheme. Um, now, one thing I haven't covered here is the fact that you can, number one, you can renew cache lines. So if all you if if you merely have this re load miss, you can send out a message to the manager that can say, "Well, has the data changed?" And you can check by using the timestamps. And you only need one message to say, "Well, it's been uh, well, there's nothing changed." You just extend the lease out and read the cache line again without transmitting data. Okay, one more question. Uh, a related question. Uh, how does uh, lease renew traffic scales with the number of cores? Because you know you can easily have a situation where you have a cache line that never changes and it's cached in every core. Mm -hmm. And if you have to renew for for this cache line every time, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm just curious what's what's the scaling implications for the lease renew traffic. Of course, this, so your question is about um, the amount of renewal traffic, pretty much, and as it scales with the number of cores. And um, a given here is that it's very application dependent, but in the paper, you'll find that re renewal traffic is quite low. And if you have um, these schemes where you're constantly doing these um, just read only operations, then you won't ever find yourself expiring your cache lines. But if you have, um, if you have these, reads and writes and um, things that cause um, these kind of ordering constraints to happen, then you may see more renewal traffic. But there's one important thing to note, which is that uh, in the release consistency semantics, um, we have a lot fewer constraints on you know, ordinary loads and stores than we do in a sequentially consistent model. Um, so we do, f we do see a lot fewer renewals if you can, if you can get the uh, release consistency programming right. But the, what, what I don't understand from your comment is um, if you have read-only case, let's say the cache line is cached in every core, in, mm -hmm. every, in thousand cores, and these, these, uh, these uh, cores that constantly read this cache line, do they still have to constantly renew the lease or they don't? They do not have to constantly renew the lease if they're, if they're PTS or they're TS min basic um, do not change. So as long as they're just doing read-only operations, they will not need to renew their cache lines. And that's kind but, of the thing. If, about they, this. If, they, if they do write other cache lines, like let's say, you, you know, if you're doing any work, you're doing some writes. So that's you right. constantly update those counters, right? That's right. So basically what that means is that you write something else, but because you wrote something else, you now renew, you have to renew the lease for the read-only uh, cache line. Is that correct? In a release consistency scheme, as long as you're not performing releases or as long as you're not performing fences, then you're not going to find yourself having to um, be constrained by this like renewal issue here because we have a we only have a minimum constraint. Um, but we can t uh, we can talk a little bit later as okay. we have a final question here. Thank you. Thanks, Juan. That's cool.